very good morning to everyone. If you have your Bible today, we'd invite you to join me in the Gospel of John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3, will be there in just a moment as we begin this new Christmas series, God's Best Gift. So looking forward to being in the text with you this Christmas season. And if you're new around here, man, we're so glad that you're here. I want to add my warm welcome to you. Uh, we'd invite you to jo- uh, download our church app at redlandhills.org, uh, where you can find an outline of today's message, some links, the Bible. Bible is there as well if you don't have one that you can follow along with today. Well, it's uh, shopping season. Uh, anybody in the room done with Christmas gift shopping? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, about five of you. Congratulations. You're way ahead of most of us. Most of us uh, have a long ways to go. I know that's true of myself. And as we're in that shopping season and gift buying, you know that those gifts have to be wrapped, most of them. And that's a pain. In fact, most Americans, uh, People Magazine did a survey of 2,000 Americans, and they said, what's the worst part of the holidays? 52% said wrapping gifts is a pain in the rear end uh, to wrap. And uh, not only that, uh, nearly as many, 51%, hate the task so much that they prefer to pay somebody else, a professional gift wrapper, to wrap their gifts. And uh, half will go out of their way to buy gifts that don't need wrapping or are easy to wrap. Maybe you've made that choice before. Or you're like, ah, just buy a bigger bag and let's just throw it in there, all right? Some, Some tissue paper on the top. In fact, we spend so much energy Wrapping gifts, the average American spends $56 per Christmas just on wrapping supplies. Yeah, I'm like, that's a lot of money, all right, for, uh, for gift wrapping that goes in the trash. And while wrapping may be a pain for many of us in general, that's just true of any gift. Then you have those hard-to-wrap gifts. Uh, has anybody ever tried to wrap one of these before? A, b- a bicycle, right? I mean, it's like, what, what do I do with that? I, I don't even know how to wrap that one. Or perhaps gym equipment or sports balls or guitars. Candles top in the list of hardest-to-wrap gifts as well. And while larger gifts can be difficult to wrap, one young man was up for the challenge 17-year-old Corbin uh, Millet decided that he wanted to uh, express, uh, want his parents to know that they had been blessed with a great gift, that they had been given the house that they live in. And even though mom and dad made the payments, he wanted to wrap the inside of their house to remind them that it was a gift, And not just the walls, he wrapped the television, the lamps, the tables, the couches, the floors, the TVs, the windows, the side tables, the artwork, everything got wrapping paper around it. He used 10 rolls of wrapping paper to cover 2,000 square feet of stuff, (laughs) to which this TikTok video was aptly named, Dad's going to have a panic attack when he sees all the wrapping paper that was used. So on December 17th, a couple of years ago, Brent and Michelle Millet woke up to everything in their house had been wrapped. And then the 47-year-old dad slipped and fell on the wrapping paper, (laughs) covering the floor, sliding into the wall. As you see, part of their reaction there on the TikTok video, which also went viral, uh, to which later on when Newsweek magazine interviewed the 17-year-old, he said, yeah, my dad was pretty furious. <laughs> and uh, after he fell, he got even more mad. And I bet he did. That's, that's, I mean, kudos to the young man for his ambition to wrap the house and say, let's be grateful for that. As big as of, of a wrapping job as that was, God had an even bigger wrapping job, and that was to wrap the gift of his son, Jesus, in the flesh, to bring him into our world, which is what we recognize this Christmas season here, that God gave the world a gift, and it was a big gift, like a really, really big gift. And the Gospels capture this and express this in different ways. And this is one of the ways that 
John, one of the disciples of Jesus, captured this statement when he said in John 3, verse 16, you can probably quote it from memory, for God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So John is just reminding us here, even if you know the Christmas story and you've seen the nativity scenes, John is reminding us here that God gave us humanity, the planet, generation from generation from generation, the gift of eternal life. Now think about that. That's a big gift. Eternal life. You mean that even though our lives on earth are consumed with preserving life, think about how much you think about every day preserving your life being safety conscious, being worried about accidents, going to the doctor, taking medicine, nutrition, caring for somebody, perhaps grieving for somebody that you've lost, anxiety about death, that God is offering us the possibility that one day we won't have to think about those things. Really? That's amazing. And Christmas ought to be a time when we consider the vastness of this amazing gift that has been given to us. It's a beautiful thing. It's a humbling thing. And it ought to elicit in us a spirit of praise and worship that God has offered us eternal life. But you know, there's a lot of forces in the world that are working to steal the joy of recognizing that gift. Because if you know death doesn't win, cancer doesn't win, sickness doesn't win, it changes the perspective about the way that you live life, doesn't it? But often we are constantly being robbed in this life. There are forces trying to steal the joy of that gift from you and I. The weariness that we experience on a daily basis, just trying to make it, the exhaustion that comes from living life, the hopelessness sometimes that we feel in our lives, perhaps even the thought of, yeah, but what are we going to do for eternity? Aren't we going to get bored? Like, we're going to be doing the same thing overnight. We just did this last week or last year. We did this 100 years ago. Are we going to feel bored one day in heaven? See, that is the enemy trying to rob you of the joy of eternity, that there are unlimited, unfathomable joys for us to experience, being in the presence of of the creator of the universe and of our savior and the worshiping community of angels. And sometimes we lose sight of that gift and we fail to see Jesus and we fail to see what he's done for us to bring that about, to liberate us from the forces of sin and death that are trying to rob us of that gift. And there's joy. When you can see that unhindered, there is joy and there is longing, there is delight, there is fulfillment and there is purpose and love when you can focus your eyes, man, on the gift that God has given to you and it ought to overwhelm us. And it especially ought to overwhelm us when considering this magnificent gift that's been given to us, eternal life is given to a broken and sinful humanity. That despite who we are as a people who malign God, rebel against God, that we are disobedient, we ignore, we despise our rebellious spirit, our sinfulness, that God still wants to give us a gift. Like when people do bad things to you, what is your response to them? Well, for many of us, if we're just being honest, we, we despise them 
or we wish them ill in their life, and we might verbalize that, at a minimum, we might just push them out of our lives altogether. I don't want anything to do with you. Occasionally, you might see uh, when a judge is going to sentence somebody who's been convicted of a crime, at times families, victims' families, or victims themselves are invited to give a statement to read before the judge about the impact that this crime has had on their life. Have you ever listened to some of those? I mean, they can be gut-wrenching. The brutality of what people experience, and sometimes the language is pretty harsh for what the victim wants the perpetrator to experience. And they might say things like, you're a monster. I hope you die a ho slow, horrible death. I hope you never see the light of day again. And they'll say things because of the pain that they've experienced in the crime that was committed against them. Some of you may personally know those emotions. We want perpetrators to get what they deserve. But how about when it comes to our own lives? What Rather then destroy us for our rebellion and sin, God gives us a gift. That's amazing, isn't it? Like, he had every reason to destroy us, to annihilate us off the face of the earth, and yet God comes in and gives us salvation. He gives us redemption. He gives us forgiveness. He could have rejected us and abandoned us, but he sent his son into the world. And he offers us that gift of eternal life. In other words, he gave us the very best and highest gift that he had to offer. What else could God have offered to us but the very gift of eternal life and redemption? And why would he do that? Man, it defies human logic. Like, why? Because I know when somebody wounds me, hurts me, commits something against me, my in natural inclination is not to be like, let me give you a gift. Why would God do that? Well, John tells us the answer that God's motivation is love. It's why. For God so loved the world that he gave. Out of love comes this gift, comes his son. The same people who rejected him, ignored him, rebelled against him, even nailed him to a cross. Love for those people? John says, yes, even those ones. God doesn't do that out of obligation because he has to. Or because he feels like it's a chore, like, oh, okay, I'll do that. But out of the core of his being, which is a heart of love for us, and it defies lo logic, what kind of love is that? In English, we can use love to say a lot of different things. We'll say, I love pizza, I love my sports team. I love my wife, I love my kids, and yet you and I both know, ah, the way we're using love there may vary slightly, right? We're using the same English word, but we really mean different things when we compare I love pizza to I love my kids. And of course, in the original language here in Greek, the, they had multiple words for love, and English, we kind of need those as well, I think. And fortunately, God's love for us isn't just flowery words. It isn't just poetry that just makes us feel good, warm and fuzzy on the inside to hear God loves us. God's love comes with action. First John, same writer, now his epistle, First John chapter 4 John writes, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live 
through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Same thing as what he said in three, John 3.16, just said it with the different words there. And when he says, this is love, what John is saying is, God gets to be the definition of love. God gets to define that. That's not defined from a human perspective. He gets to set the standard here. Because love is not based, as we often think it is from a human standpoint, on something like emotion or temporary feelings. Is there plenty of days when you're married, you wake up and you say, I don't feel very loving today. It's not based on performance, our ability to make God happy. So then he loves us just when we do good. It's not based on our looks or our ability to return that kind of love. Like God loves me because I love him. No, it doesn't work out that way either. Because it wasn't your idea, and you didn't reach out to him first. He came to you in your brokenness, in your sin, and all of the junk that we have in our lives. And see, what John is working against here is our very bad experiences and bad definitions about what love is. Because when we hear the word love, many of us filter that through the lenses of our experiences of people who said they loved us, but then they failed us. Or somebody who said the right things that made me feel love, but in the end they betrayed me. Or that person who, ah, we thought we loved each other and then we felt like love diminished or perhaps was extinguished. Those earthly experiences can flavor how we hear God loves us. We might tend to transfer that and think, yeah, but if it's the same kind of love as so-and-so, I'm not sure it's going to be there forever. Or how do I know they're not going to hurt me? And so God must be the same. And so some of us, when we hear this phrase, God is love, may, may hear it with some sort of skepticism. Or we might think it sounds nice, but it doesn't really match reality. And that's why John reminds us that God's love for us is more than just words. But God backs it up with action. This is how he showed his love to us. We don't have to wonder. You know, is it just a hollow statement, an empty statement? God loves us, and we go around, we say nice things like that. And if some of you are thinking, I don't know that God loves me, then for John would say the answer to that question is Christmas. How do I know God loves me? God took action, and he sent in the flesh his son into our world. And that is why Christmas is a really big deal. Not just because it's a holiday where we get the days off work and we're together with family and good food and all the fun stuff. I get all of that. That's part of the celebration. But we can't lose sight of the reason that Christmas is a really big deal. The love of God was made manifest in our world. And so Christmas, the reason that we have a big celebration is because we're celebrating our salvation comes wrapped in love. This amazing gift of God comes to us through His love. And to be around Jesus would have been to felt God's love. Can you imagine like hanging out with Jesus in the flesh, what that would have been like? I mean, what a cool experience. And one day in, in eternity, we're going to have that experience. You just visualize 2,000 years ago that you're sitting in Galilee and Jesus is walking on the seashore and you get to spend the day with Jesus. Like what that would have been like. 
to have felt his love. I, did, I wonder if people like felt so incredibly loved by the way that Jesus leaned in and listened to them when they talked. When people who had experienced life's hardships and griefs and burdens, when those people who were desperate for healing came to explain what they were going through, what they were living through, and just to have the listening ears of Jesus just hear every single word that they said. Because, you know, when somebody listens to you, not just like, here's what you say, but they really tune in. Like they're actively listening to what you have to say and they care deeply and they're moved. You feel loved by that. You feel seen. You feel heard. Maybe it was Jesus's eyes when somebody's talking to him or he's talking to them and he has that stare. Eyes of affection, eyes of love that were poured out and people would have just felt love. You've, you've, most of us have experienced that before. Somebody has looked at us in a way that we knew that we were loved. Or maybe to spend time with Jesus and we bear our problem or our issues going on in life, or we have a friend and Jesus says, can I pray for you now? And to be prayed over by Jesus. Can you imagine the chill bumps that you would have experienced to have hands laid on you and to be prayed over by the Son of God? How awesome. Or maybe you could have witnessed that kind of love by watching Jesus play with little kids. And the disciples are like, don't bother the master, he's a big deal. Like, and Jesus is like, let, let these kids come with me. And I just imagine him being down on their level and laughing and playing and enjoying their unbridled enthusiasm. Perhaps they would have felt his love through a compassionate touch when there was tears and weeping and emotion and just him laying his hand on your hand and you would have known. Or to see as we see with his dear friend Lazarus where Jesus sheds tears himself. Even though he knew he's about to say Lazarus come out the grave and he's about to walk out and everybody's going to celebrate and it's going to be an amazing miracle. In the moment, his friends, Mary and Martha, felt overwhelming grief and sadness and pain. And Jesus is so full of love, he enters into their pain. See, it was the love of God made manifest. How do we know God loves us? I just look at the life of Jesus. To see Jesus is to see God's love. And John continues, verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. This gift of love that you and I have been given, humanity has been given, is not just a gift that we receive and we hoard it for ourselves. Like, just love me, God, pour into me as if we are the end of God's love. But this gift of love is meant to be Shared And John says, when we share it, people also see God. Someone visited our church last year for the first time. They live out of town. And I've been to church in 30 years. At the end of the message, they shared with me, I felt God in this place. And how did they feel that? They felt it because they were loved. And you know the difference between walking in a place where you're wanted or not wanted. I mean, we want to have the kind of culture here where people experience that. We have received God's love, but we are an extension of God's love, and it flows through us. Such was the case with a guy named Milton Hershey. Yes, that Hershey, Hershey chocolate bars. Praise God for Hershey. All right, let's just say... Perhaps one of the greatest Americans to ever 
walk the planet. If you ever have a chance, go to Hershey, Pennsylvania. It's definitely worth. The whole town just smells like chocolate, okay? But you may not know this. Milton Hershey and his wife, Catherine, were actually people of deep faith. Uh, Pennsylvania Dutch background, uh, generations of chocolate makers and their family turned this into an incredible business in a very difficult time. Uh, Milton Hershey operated in uh, during the time of and before even World War I was occurring in the turn of the 20th century in that part of Pennsylvania. And he amassed a lot of wealth. As you can imagine, the Hershey Corporation today is extremely big corporation, and it was even in those days more than 100 years ago. Hershey and his wife Catherine were unable to have kids, and yet they wanted to be conduits and bearers of God's love to the world around them. World War I comes to an end in November 1918. Two days later, Milton Hershey decides to put the bulk of his wealth, he and Catherine's wealth, 500,000 shares of the Hershey Corporation into a trust to care for orphan boys in their community. They had started a school about a little more than a decade earlier for orphans. Of course, a very difficult time in our world. World War I is going on here. And so they began to care and they began to pay for house parents to help take care of these boys. And they wanted them to know and experience the love of God. And they had this vision to love kids, to create Christian homes, to give them education, to provide nutrition, to provide health care. Everything that they needed could be taken care of long after Mr. and Ms. Hershey had passed away. And at the time, it didn't get any attention that the Hersheys had put their 500,000 shares of Hershey Corporation into this trust until about five years later. You know how Wall Street and everybody starts calculating the value of things and research. And the New York Times discovers this 500,000 shares have been put into this trust to care for orphans, and they put a value on it based on the current stock market, and it came out to $60 million in 1918 money. The value today would be calculated somewhere north of $1.3 billion. And today, in 2024... The Milton Hershey School still exists, except it doesn't just care for boys. It's boys and girls. There's an equal number today. And more than 2,000 kids every year are served in this community where godly house parents are empowered to love on these kids. They're given the very best education and nutrition and clothing, and it doesn't cost anybody's family one single dime. Now, if you were going to ask, did Milton and Catherine Hershey love people around them? You would have an unquestionable yes. How do we know? I mean, they put it into action. It wasn't just words, but they did something with it. How do you know that God loves you? He gave. He gave. That's what we're celebrating this Christmas. He gave his son, wrapped in love, and shared that son, that gift with the world. And so what can we do when we're the recipients of that? When somebody gives you an amazing gift, like you, you want to say, thank you. Oh, it's amazing. I appreciate that. But words only go so far, don't they? To express appreciation. You can write a card. You can write a thank you note. You can try to give them a gift as well. But how do you deeply share our gratitude and joy for what's been given to us? John would say, We take what's been given to us and we pour it into the lives of the world around us. Which is why John continues in in verse 16. He says this, God is love. Whoever lives in love 
lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment that in this world, this world, we are like Jesus. And maybe some of us, we struggle with the confidence to face God in judgment. We're uncertain about our salvation. I think John would say to us today, don't lean into fear, lean into love. Lean into expressing that into the world around us. Because it isn't just that God is loving, which he is, or that God gave love as a gift, which he did, but that his very essence of his being is love. And when you and I receive that, and then when we go out and live that, the world changes. The world is transformed. So I think John would say to us that we honor the gift by becoming like the gift. Does anybody in the room need to become more loving and more like Jesus? (laughs) Me, 100%. And this is a great time to ask ourselves, man, are there some ways, are there some areas that I need to grow in my love so that in this world, not just in the future world, in this world, in this life, now, today, where I'm at, here in Wetumpka, Alabama, can I be more loving? And as you consider this gift that's been given to you and becoming more like it, a great question to ask ourselves is, well, how do I need to become more loving? Like it it could be just a concept out there and everybody could say, yeah, I need to. But like, how do you need to? Maybe some of us, like the joy of loving others has been robbed from us because we are holding on to unforgiveness or bitterness in our lives that robs us. And so we're not able to be a conduit of his love because we're holding on to all of this garbage in our heart and in our mind that steals that joy. And so we don't feel loving because we're consumed with bitterness and unforgiveness, which is why Jesus commands us to deal with it and get rid of it. You, You won't be a full vessel of love as long as you hang on to all of that. And it doesn't matter if the other person needs thinks they need your forgiveness or not, you're still commanded to forgive because God wants you to be free to love. Or for some of us, maybe we're so self-absorbed with our own issues, our own problems that's going on in our life that we fail to see the needs of of problems in others' lives because we're so self-consumed. And love would say to us today, God would say through his love, I'm going to pour into you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to be there for you. Take your eyes off yourself, always thinking about you and your needs and your wants and your desires and put them on somebody else. And I bet you'll find that God takes care of you in a pretty amazing and miraculous way. Or for others of us, maybe it is We talk a good game about love. If we were to say, are you loving? You'd say, I'm a loving person. I love other people. God is love. And you know all the Bible verses. But maybe we talk a good game, but we don't have enough action to back that up. And we need to step out and do some things, maybe even some hard things, to express this is how God showed his love, that he sent his son into the world. And that was not an easy thing for Jesus to experience and walk this life. It was self-sacrificial, which is why God gets to define what love is. Love is not taking. Love is laying down your life for the other. 
And if today you're thinking, yeah, I'm probably not where I need to be, the good news for you today is that God has an endless supply of love to fill your tank that you can be that conduit. God does not run out of love. The love bank is always full. It's always overflowing in God's house. And maybe the first place we start with today is to say, Lord, I want to receive that in its fullest measure. I want to get it, not just so I can hoard it, but so that I can let it flow through me into the world around us. Because that would be the best Christmas gift that you could give anybody this Christmas season. The gift of salvation wrapped in the love of Christ. Let's stand together today. Lord, we thank you for that gift. Lord, we praise you for Jesus who came into our world, who put on flesh and came wrapped in love for us. A conduit, an expression of your love, Lord. And today, may we just be in awe and wonder of how magnificent it is and how amazing it is that you would love people like us with our failures and our sin and our brokenness and our needs, Lord, that your love is big enough for all of that from generation to generation. And so we worship you, Lord, today because you gave us the person of Jesus. And Lord, we want today to be a people have a culture in our church and in our individual lives that we are known for being loving because we have been loved. Lord, help us, inspire us to put that love into action. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.